Thank you, Debbie and Alex, for having me. Um, we're going to switch now from sharks to salamanders and from brain to limb. So I hope you can keep up there. And I shortened my title to make it a bit simpler. So today, what I'd like to do is to use the analogy of a jigsaw puzzle to try to convey to you some molecular insights we're getting into this really exciting process of limb regeneration. So, so as developmental biologists, you all know that the adult body is one of the most complex jigsaw puzzles that we can find in nature. We all derive from one single fertilized egg cell that then differentiates to give rise to all of these different cell types that make us today who we are. And you also know that unfortunately, if we lose any parts of our jigsaw puzzle during adult life, for example, due to injury or disease, then in many cases, these jigsaw pieces can no longer be replaced. And that's because we're notoriously poor at regenerating. And therefore, a very important question for regenerative research is to try to understand if we can one day replace or restore missing jigsaw pieces in adult patients. For example, by creating new jigsaw pieces, or perhaps by making use of the neighboring pieces that remain around the injury. A very relevant uh, rege regenerative organism for this question is the axolotl, which is a salamander. And it's a vertebrate like us. And despite having a very similar body plan to humans, it's highly regenerative. It can restore many tissues around the body, including the limb, which I'll talk about today, as well as many other tissues as indicated on the slide. Many decades of limb regeneration research in the axolotl have shown that a very important requirement for limb regeneration is positional memory. To go back to that jigsaw puzzle analogy at the beginning, Positional memory is a property of post-embryonic cells in which they retain spatial identities assigned to them during embryonic development and then use this to direct patterning for post-embryonic processes such as regeneration. Today we're going to talk about one um, axis in the limb, the anterior-posterior axis, which in humans would correspond to the thumb-little finger axis. In axolotls, a limb amputation will trigger anterior red cells to migrate to the amputation plane, as well as posterior blue cells. There they will meet and form a structure called the blastema, which is a proliferative structure containing all of the spatial information necessary to restore the missing part of the tissue. And how does that happen? Eli Tanaka's group and others in previous years have shown that this is um, a process that requires signaling molecules, including FGF8, which is expressed by anterior red blastema cells, and sonic hedgehog, which is expressed by posterior blue uh, blastema cells. And these evolutionarily conserved ligands interact in an interdependent positive feedback loop to maintain tissue outgrowth and enable repatterning to eventually restore the missing part of the limb. I was very attracted to this system in order to study the question of positional memory because it's a relatively simple modular system with two components, anterior and posterior, that are together necessary to drive regeneration. So it's a very um, robust and simple system to begin to look at this process. And more remarkably than that, not only is it necessary for regeneration, but actually these two modular identities are together sufficient to pattern a limb-like structure. Let me show you what I mean by that. In a different essay called the accessory limb model, it's possible to graft, transplant a patch of blue cells into the red part of the limb. And under the right experimental conditions, by putting the red and blue cells next to each other, it's possible to grow out an entire ectopic limb called the accessory limb. And you can see a real example there on the right. So by interrogating the factors that control red and blue identity, it's clearly possible to begin to unravel both limb regeneration and the formation of de novo limbs. And so, so far, what I've told you is that the axolotl limb harbors at least two types of jigsaw puzzle piece, red and blue, that after injury will go on to activate different signaling centers, FGF8 and Sonic Hedgehog, that together drive regeneration. But this opens up very interesting questions. For example, the ultimate source of positional memory, i.e. the thing that makes red and blue cells different from each other in the context of the uninjured limb, actually remains unknown. And that's the first question I'd like to address in this talk. So how do cells stably encode different positional memories to each other? And secondly, by understanding these mechanisms, will it one day become possible to control these positional memories in order to change signaling outcomes from regenerative cells? 
So to begin to address these questions, I performed gene expression profiling of anterior or posterior cells purified by fat from uninjured axolotl limbs. Very interestingly, we found that over 300 genes were differentially expressed in axolotl limbs across the anterior posterior axis, even prior to injury. So these cells are clearly strongly primed to be different to one another. Among all of the genes, I'm highlighting with this arrow the expression of one transcription factor called HAND2, whose statistical significance really stood out to us, and it was the most dominant uh, signature gene in posterior cells that we recovered in this data set. HAND2 is actually a very important for any limb, uh, limb researcher because it's been shown in many vertebrate limb buds, such as mouse, chick, and zebrafish, that HAND2 can positively regulate the expression of sonic hedgehog which is that posterior signaling center gene that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. So this led to a very obvious hypothesis, which was that if post-embryonic axolotls continuously express HAN2 throughout life, this could be a priming factor that tells them to remain posterior in identity and to switch on sonic hedgehog expression after an amputation. So we wanted to test if this genetic interaction is indeed evolutionarily conserved using mutation and misexpression analyses. We first generated a transgenic reporter axolotl in which expression of sonic hedgehog induces the expression of a blue fluorescent protein, which you can see in that image there in the posterior limb bud. When we generated hand to mutant animals, so these are mosaic mutant animals by CRISPR, in the background of this reporter, we found that this significantly reduced the expression of the sonic hedgehog reporter, supporting that hand to is indeed necessary for sonic hedgehog expression. Importantly, this had consequences for regeneration because when we took the limbs that formed and then amputated them, these limbs were unable to regenerate properly and the most mutated limbs did not regenerate at all. So the genetic interaction of HAN2 being necessary for sonic hedgehog expression appears to be conserved in axolotls. We next performed the reverse experiment of misexpressing HAN2 using the same sonic hedgehog reporter as a readout. Compared to controls, when we misexpressed HAND2 throughout the limb bud, so not only in the posterior part, but throughout the limb bud, we found that it was able to induce anterior ectopic sonic hedgehog expression, as you can see by that arrowhead there in the anterior part of the limb bud. When we grew up these animals, these animals usually had extra fingers. This is a phenotype in common with mouse uh, misexpression animals. But in rare cases, we were able to recover an axolotl specific phenotype which was the production of an entire ectopic limb from that misexpression site. You can see one example there. And this shows us that HAN2 can indeed trigger sonic hedgehog expression, and that this is clearly critical for limb morphogenesis because at the right dose and in the right place, it's able to generate a whole limb on its own. So together, these data and others support that continuous expression of HAN2 throughout life in the axolotl primes posterior cells in the limb to be able to express sonic hedgehog after an amputation. And this could be one distinguishing feature between the red and blue puzzle pieces in the limb. But this leads me now to the second part of the talk in which I wanted to ask, well, are these positional memory states fixed once they're established in the embryo or can they actually be altered through acute treatments? So is positional memory fixed or is it reprogrammable? To address this question, we had to come up with a new assay one in which we could track live the positional identity of anterior and posterior cells and see how they change in response to manipulations. For this assay, we generated a new double transgenic knock-in axolotl in which anterior cells are labeled with M. cherry fluorophore in magenta and posterior cells are labeled with EGFP fluorophore in green. And I'm sorry for the color change in the second part of the presentation. So you can see an example of a double reporter limb there on the left. And from this animal, what we did was we purified either a pure population of anterior cells or a pure population of posterior cells by fax. And then we uh, transplanted them by cell injection into the opposite side of an unlabeled host limb, which you can see in the schematic to the right. The design of this experiment is that we want to take cells out of their normal environment, put them somewhere else and see whether they keep their original identity or whether they can switch and reprogram to match the destination identity. Let's start with the anterior to posterior transplantation first. In this image, you can see 
the M. cherry positive anterior cells injected into the posterior of the unlabeled host. But over two weeks after injection, these cells remained M. cherry positive, suggesting that they remain anterior in identity. So we then amputated the limb in a way that the transplanted cells could contribute to the regenerating blastema, which you can see there up to six days post amputation. Very excitingly, from day 10, what we saw was the gradual appearance of green EGFP positive cells in the blastema. EGFP suggests a posterior identity. These cells express HAN2. And just to remind you, only the transplanted cells carry the EGFP transgene in this assay. So this means that the new posterior cells must have arisen from the anterior transplant. These green cells persisted throughout regeneration and survived into the regenerated limb, as you can see there on the right. This experiment actually tells us two things. Firstly, cells that were injected but were not recruited into the blastema, these cells remained M. cherry positive and anterior in identity. This suggests that at steady state, positional memory is fixed. But of the descendants of those cells, the ones that were recruited into the blastema and transited that state, these cells were able to turn into posterior looking cells that became green. So in the blastema, positional memory appears to be reprogrammable. To confirm that the previously anterior cells were indeed being posteriorized, we took those regenerated limbs and we performed a second amputation through the green part of the limb. This generated a second blastema and more green cells. And importantly, by in situ hybridization on the right, we were able to see that some of these green cells were able to express sonic hedgehog that posterior signaling center factor. Taken together, this shows us that originally anterior cells had indeed been converted to true posterior cells to express sonic hedgehog during regeneration, something that they would never normally do. In further assays, we demonstrated that this reprogramming ability is dependent on endogenous sonic signaling. We repeated the assay, uh, which you can see on the top row, um, either as, as is to, by default, or in the presence of a pharmacological drug called BMS that blocks sonic hedgehog signaling on the bottom row. And there on the bottom, you can see that those magenta anterior cells do not reprogram if sonic hedgehog signaling is blocked. This suggests that in the transplantation assay, the transplanted anterior cells came into the proximity of endogenous posterior sonic hedgehog, and this reprogrammed their identity to become new posterior cells. To finish this experiment, we performed the inverse assay. So we also transplanted posterior double reporter cells to the anterior side of a unlabeled host limb. You can see here that the result was rather different. In this case, those posterior cells remained green both at steady state and also after amputation, showing that the posterior state is very stable and does not change readily towards an anterior identity. This reflects some inequality in the anterior posterior positional memory system that had not previously been um, explored. So we can infer then that whilst anterior cells are readily reprogrammed to a posterior state, posterior cells do not readily lose their posterior memory. So all in all, we think that we're one step closer to a molecular basis for positional memory and its reprogrammability during regeneration. From the axolotl limb, if we look at the blue puzzle pieces, we found that they continuously express HAN2 transcription factor. And this presumably primes the posterior cells so that after an amputation, they're able to induce expression of sonic hedgehog in the posterior blastema. Later during regeneration, secreted sonic hedgehog feeds back and supplements uh, induces HAN2 expression in nearby posterior cells. And we think that this positive feedback architecture, HAN2 to sonic, sonic to HAN2, stably preserves posterior positional memory throughout a regeneration cycle and accounts for its stability. We also think that the same feedback loop can explain the reprogrammability of positional memory in the second part of the talk. Let's now take an anterior red puzzle piece cell. This does not normally express HAN2 and therefore does not usually express sonic hedgehog. But in the context of a blastema, if we apply an ectopic source of sonic hedgehog, either directly or through the transplantation assay and putting it near sonic hedgehog expressing cells, these red puzzle pieces can readily induce expression of hand two and become blue puzzle pieces. And because of that positive feedback architecture that I mentioned in the previous slide, you can see that this pos posterior state is stably retained. <laughs> 
And so what's very exciting for me is that we've kind of decoupled positional identity from embryonic development. We've taken a cell that had never been posterior before, and during adult life, we've managed to reprogram it so that it behaves more like a posterior cell. So just to finish up in the, and give you an idea of the bigger picture, we think that we're, we've taken a first step towards being able to change positional memory in regenerative cells, cells as a means to stably alter their signaling properties. And I think that's really exciting because if we look at similar jigsaw puzzle piece properties across different tissues, this may allow us to unlock latent abilities to combine uh, jigsaw pieces within and between tissues in synthetic engineering and repair applications. And that's something I'd love to follow up on in the future. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. And I'd like to thank you all for staying with me. A particular thanks to the development webinar series for allowing me to speak today and to Debbie and Alex for hosting. A big thanks to Ellie Tanaka and her lab in Vienna for being amazing colleagues, in particular the individuals listed there on the slide who have been instrumental to this project. If you'd like to get in touch, my contact details are there, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Leo, for an exciting uh, seminar. So we have um, a question in the chat. Is the RARES-1 crucial for positional memory, and how is this controlled by Sonic Hedgehog and FGF8? Uh, is the rarest one. Ah, I see. So this is proximal distal axis. So um, <clears throat> this is referring to a, a, a publication that came out recently, which is to do with the shoulder to hand axis. This paper does not address positional memory. We have shown that patterning is preserved through multiple regeneration cycles and is stably inherited. Whereas in that paper, the authors did not address that question. So um, we haven't quite put those two axes together yet, but that will definitely be interesting to follow up on in the future. So the next question is regarding when the window that you could see these uh, reprogramming events take place. Is it something that can only in be induced by amputation or is there um, a time window during development where it could be done? That's also an interesting question. So I have not done the developmental uh, experiments, but like I showed, the behavior is specific to amputation in the context of post-embryonic uh, animal because it does not happen at steady state, even if we apply sonic hedgehog to the limb. And the next question is regarding hand to expression and uh, the presence of spatial memory in species that don't have the capacity for regeneration. Yes, so that's something I'd love to follow up on. So I've begun to look into some single cell data sets, or actually from adult human patients. Um, there's a beautiful paper with profiling of um, human patients up to 60 years old. And excitingly, um, they can detect hand two in a limb biopsy. So we know that the gene is expressed, but we don't know how it's expressed spatially. So it's going to be an interesting question to see whether the spatial architecture has been compromised because, for example, the gene is expressed everywhere or not enough, or uh, whether there is something else missing, like metabolism or cofactors or something else specific to regeneration. And so is HAN2 expressed at different levels across the proximal distal axis? And uh, another related question to that is um, what factors are driving this positional effect that lead to FGF8 signaling? Okay, so first question. Um, I don't have the answer about the expression level along the proximal distal axis. Um, I'm measuring that now. Um, however, I have some... Um, Prelox P animals to lineage trace the hand to animals. And I'd always noticed that at one tamoxifen dose, the same one, the um, efficiency of conversion is always better in the distal end of the arm. So one possibility is that hand two is indeed expressed weaker as you get towards the shoulder, which makes it harder to lineage label those cells. But that's something I'd like to follow up on. Your second question about the anterior memory, the other side of the arm, um, we don't have an answer yet. We're going to dive into that from our spatial sequencing. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Leo.